Hello guys, welcome back to another video. And today, much like last year, when I premiered a video similar to this about 2022 superhero things on June 30th of 2022, I will be talking about all the comic book superhero related content that has released in the past six months just to stay up to date with it all. And in, at the end of the video, unlike last year, I'll likely be going into my thoughts on the genre as a whole currently and my thoughts and hopes for the future. Without further ado, hi, my name is Tyler. And I love film. And today I'll be talking about the 2023 superhero movies and TV series. To start out with our first piece of Marvel or DC, or just superhero content in general that was released earlier this year, is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Yeah, film. This film was today badly I reviewed, but I don't think it deserves to be as judged harshly as it was. And I think this film was much better than many think, but it still is not great. It has many issues. But I'd like to start off with the good. And one of those good things is that this film, for better or worse, feels like a normal MCU movie. That's probably because it was an Ant-Man movie, but it just doesn't feel as aggressively mediocre or as strangely different as many of the other films in phase four have as this is start of phase five the film is entertaining enough with its tone and weird sci-fi aesthetic with its comedy spread throughout with some of the jokes actually landing this time and with its normal mcu superhero action but where it really falters is in these areas how many of these things feel completely forced into the movie and how underwhelming and underdeveloped the villain was. The villain in this movie, Kang, barely has any motivation and provides zero menace, just like Namor. Just like many of the villains of recent, Kang has many things that pull him down from being a great villain and one of the greatest MCU villains. Is that an ant? I wasn't even joking, I actually just saw an ant. Okay, back to the video. The film also has plenty of plot conveniences and contrivances that really pull the movie down and cause plot holes. The film also has weak character arcs and uses of emotion throughout the film that are still there but are used to their least extent to make the film just pass enough as a functional product. The stakes are also extremely low in the film and they actually get lower throughout the film and by the end of the movie we're just watching events happen. These low stakes and weak aspects of a film that this movie exemplifies really reminds me of old MCU films, which it quite felt like, which initially when watching was a refreshing after films like Thor Love and Thunder, The Eternals, and Wakanda Forever. But it's formulaic plot, annoying humor, well, sometimes at least, low stakes, invisible character arcs and development, and a failed attempt at a villain. I'll leave this film feeling as repetitive, bland, and unsatisfying as last Batman film, but there's a greater scale, or smaller scale if you want to think about it, and more colorful visuals that kind of amplify this film, with more risks taken, if you can even call them that, with the story. Needless to say, this is better than the second Ant-Man film, but nowhere near as creative and inventive as the first one was, even though it still wasn't great. Seriously, man, King had no menace, weak motivation, was very low on the power scale, and didn't even have cool moments. Very underwhelming. Because of all this, I've settled on a 7.6 of this film's final score. Originally an 8.5. Less than a month later, we got Shazam 2, Fury of the Gods, or just Shazam Fury of the Gods. And sadly, this one was also a box office disappointment, actually a box office failure, and a critical failure and disappointment. And yeah, both of these films got bad ratings. This is not a very good time for superhero films. Despite all this, when I watched Shazam Fury of the Gods, I thought it was a solid yet unremarkable and a, an additional meh film from and for the DCEU. Some could say this and even The Flash, which we'll get to later, are and is a very mcu -y DC film. But I don't think this one is mcu -y as much as it is the first film, just with all of the obnoxious child stuff cranked up to l almost 11 and with some of the heart and humor sucked out of it. That may have sounded harsh, but I do not hate this film or think it is bad films. I think it does everything perfectly well with its characters, just some things kind of meander and waste time in the film. And everything that does actually do right with its characters and develop them, which this film does do a better job than Ant-Man and the Watch Quantumania before, if we're gonna make comparisons, it also has a lot of missed opportunities and choices that I don't think were very creatively or intelligently made for the film, such as how unserious it is at moments when it should be serious and when and in moments when that seriousness would work, as opposed to its lightheartedness, how it addresses some plot beats and explains things and how it deals with the side characters or the rest of the Shazam 
Captain Marvel family. Don't get me wrong, the film does have nice enough character work and action scenes and camera movements, thanks very much to David F. Sandberg. The film's just very messy. And, oh yeah, we're on the topic of that. The villains of this film, which are very cliche and not very well done. I mean, why'd they just have to make up Shazam villains only to not make a third movie, which they're probably not doing? I mean, seriously, the Daughters of Atlas... They were okay enough, and they served the conflict of the film, and yeah, I like seeing Shazam fight dragons. But, no. The film can even be uncompelling with his characters, leading the parts of the film to feel flat and even boring, which this kind of film should never feel. And it does have a very three-act structure. You can literally see while watching the film the second the script changed from Act 2 to Act 3. And, yeah, it's messy. Overall, the film is not bad. It's just a little messy and not as compelling as the first film because it doesn't focus as much on the heart of the characters because I feel that this film was really rushed out and didn't have enough time to marinate with its own story and develop its own story and conflicts with the characters. Because things that happen in this film seem to just happen because the movie wants them to happen and not because it feels like a logical exploration of Shazam or any of his family members. This leaves the rest of the film to feel generic and unexpired, and the villains also suffer as a result of this, and many choices made in the film feel very contrived and forced, such as its uptake and humor to really fill the runtime. Overall, I do not hate this film. It is not great, and almost everything about it, even things I have not mentioned, are very meh. Nothing terrible, nothing very good either. A perfectly watchable film though, for the most part, so I give this film a 7.4 out of 10. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is, I think, a very well done film, even if it took me a second to accept it for what it was, and one that I think really bookends this era, at least, of the Guardians of the Galaxy, but can also serve as a very good farewell. The film has a great villain and driving force and motivation for the heroes and plot. This direction just has something so unique, stylized, and with its own vibe that gives this film its own identity, and it flashes out the worlds of the Guardians so much more than the other films did in such little time. It has great action, just great James Gunn Guardians of the Galaxy shenanigans. It's thrilling, it has emotion, and it feels like it was a story that needed to be told about these characters, about Rocket, and about Peter Quill. This movie feels like a real film made by a real filmmaker with a real voice by a real auteur. And even though many elements seem to be forced, like plot elements and music, the film's message about pain really shines through. Oh yeah, the beautiful, heartbreaking rocket storyline. For all these reasons and more, I give this film a 9.3 out of <gasps> Sorry, I wanted to go faster. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is a very well-done film with beautiful animation that really elevates its own art film and that, as every animated film should do, uses its medium, its art form, to elevate its own story and stylize itself beautifully. Though I believe that both this film was being overhyped and that the first one was better, and I wasn't a massive fan of the first one, but could still acknowledge its greatness and mature storytelling, this film is still very well done and has the same kind of mature storytelling. It just doesn't go as deep into its characters as that film did and isn't as compelling to me on a story or character level. This film hits many emotional beats and for many of you, it might have hit or hit much deeper as many of the things in this film might come as a shock to you. But the narrative of this film really isn't too much of a shock when compared to other films like it, but it is very well done and really pushes the limits of animated films and superhero films in general. Unlike most superhero films, this film really feels like it has something to say. And this film is able to say something about paving your own way in life and, well, spoilers, taking the plunge. Though I found the film a lot of times to be a little too plot heavy, especially when compared to the first one, where a similar scene that this film has to its What's Up Danger scene in the first film really just highlights the differences between these two films and this film's fault. How the last film really just made you feel for that scene, not because it was viscerally thrilling or just, you know, thrilling, because it was rooted in its characters. This film was more rooted in the situations going on with its characters, and the, and the story and arc seemed to be more hidden beneath these things. But none of that is to undermine how well this film does with its characters on its own, and really grapples with all the storylines it's trying to tell, and all the characters it's trying to use. It has two great antagonists, and some very good reveals that are surprising and thrilling throughout the entire film. I like the way it uses Gwen Stacy and makes her more of a central character in this film. It explains her origin and life as opposed to Miles, really fleshing out their relationship and dynamic more. I also love how much the film in the first 50 minutes pays attention to its two main characters and throughout the entire film really sets things up. I like how 
the, in the different universes, they have different art styles for all the Spider-Men. And I like all the cameos in the film, including Spectacular Spider-Man, technically 90s Spider-Man with um, Spider-Man Unlimited being there, technically being that version of Spider-Man. Um, 1960s Spider-Man, Dinosaur Spider-Man, um, one or two live action cameos. Yeah, there's just a lot of fun. Though most people say that this film is part one and doesn't have really a full story, full arc for Miles, I believe it does, and it has two arcs. One that will be continued into the next film, and one that was really being developed in this film. Miles taking true responsibility for some of his actions, making hard choices, and well, taking a plunge and taking a risk, doing what he thinks to be right, fully taking control of his life, and the next film will continue this idea and arc of taking control of your life with Miles having to likely make some crazy choices in the next film. But it's this film's story about its two lead characters and their connection to each other that really makes this film a cut above the rest and a second all-timer superhero film in a row. Out of this three, film is really flash. just a rush and a perfect Miles Morales story. I give this film a 9.2 out of 10. So The Flash is actually decent. If we can look past the CGI and pretty much every messy aspect of the movie, which is the entire movie itself, this film has heart, which really elevates it. And it never loses sight of the only thing it needs to keep in its sight, which is that heart, which is the core of the story, the purpose of it, the message, the characters. The fact that Barry needs to realize not just that he can't solve every problem, but that he shouldn't. Maybe he needs to let go of his selfishness and guilt. Maybe he needs to stop trying to fix and cover up the scars that make him human. Maybe he needs to slow down for a second and put aside his selfishness and sacrifice something for the greater being of two worlds, of a multiverse. Because at the end of the day, it is what it is. Even though the film can be very messy, even though the entirety of this film feels underdeveloped, rushed, and half-baked, even though it might not handle his nostalgia and villains and cameos so perfectly, and if the film, just in general, is not perfect, it's a sheer conviction to the story of Barry Allen that holds this film together. For all these reasons, I give this film an 8.6 out of 10. Very fun, cool the Secret Invasion storyline has always been one that has had a lot of potential, so I was very much looking forward to this show. Even though the actual comic storyline is not that great, the story has a lot of potential to be done very well and has been done in different mediums, such as the Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes TV series. So I was looking very much forward to this show. But recent Marvel projects have kind of tapered my expectations for this show. So how is it two episodes in? Well, it's not bad, but it definitely isn't great. Or living up to its true potential. The only problems I really see with this show, though, are the fact that it doesn't really grab your attention and that it's very dialogue heavy. And the dialogue isn't particularly that well written and it needs to do a lot more showing instead of telling. And the last problem I see with the show is that it struggles to juggle and pace its character, depth, and storylines properly. Hopefully the show gets better, but as of right now, it's in the 7.5 to 8 range, but I'm going to give it an 8.1 out of 10 for now. I'll be back in six months to review the rest of the show and update my rating. More news including Insomniac Spider-Man 2 coming out, showcasing three of my favorite Spider-Man villains, and it looks really good. The Craven the Hunter movie trailer also recently dropped, though I'm very disappointed in their lack of usage of an accent and proper adaptation of Craven. It still looks very solid, just not as great and stylized as I hoped in my dreams. James Gunn's DCEU that was announced a few months ago seems to finally be happening. We just got the casting announcements for Superman and Lois. Hopefully they're good. The actual Superman and Lois TV show just got season three, which is very solid. Flash just got season nine and ended. And Gotham Knights happened. Marvel, well, Disney as a whole, has delayed everything like there's no tomorrow. Hopefully they're actually taking the time to make all these things good. Well, delayed everything except for Devil 3, which is now coming out even earlier. Yes. <gasps> Let's hope I didn't miss anything. Here are my brief thoughts and hopes for the futures of Marvel and DC. For Marvel overall, I hope they figure themselves out. I really hope Jonathan Majors is not going to prison and is not guilty. I really hope Marvel takes some more pure risks with their films, maybe even develops a new formula that can stand against the formulas of the Infinity Saga and Phase 4. I hope that they make the Multiverse Saga actually culminate in something and make it actually live up to its name with a final entry in Avengers Secret Wars that really pays off everything by introducing characters from the entire Marvel Multiverse but making them feel good as integral parts of the story, making it all feel like it matters and not feel cheap and do something so epic creative and original that will close off 
Marvel as we know it up to this point and open up the door for the next era. No politics, no rush products, no passionless films, just good expressionist stories. For DC, I hope that all the new films are very true interpretations of their character with all the benefits of modern filmmaking. No matter how much like the Snyderverse or DCEU, I hope this film does something different to stand out and grab audiences in by doing properly using bold and creative things. And with next year having no DC films besides Joker 2, I hope they really take the time to develop a proper universe where each film has its own vision. and identity with the universe. It just has so many properties that go in different directions. Yeah, those are my hopes. Thank you for watching.